Now, this actually means don't take the Jews and Christians for intimate confidants. Of course, you can be friendly with them. You, a Muslim man can marry a Christian or a Jewish woman. Right? So there will be a contradiction if it is you can't, can't even talk to them, anything like that. So you can be friendly, but not too friendly. Okay? And those who take the religion for a mockery or sport, that again is something that you can't take seriously from them. Now, this is referred to as the verse of the sword. And it's used by all our enemies. What this means is that Muslims can lay in wait anywhere in any passage, dark alley, corner, and kill any guy who walks along. That's what it says. Unfortunately, it's not the story. <coughs> That's the very next ayah, very next verse. So it doesn't say kill them indiscriminately. Now, whenever you talk about anything from the Quran, you should know the context. Not only should you know the context, you should know if it is something which is time dependent or independent of time. Is it a general case? Is it a specific case? You must know these things when you talk. And if someone quotes something to you, what is the context? Do you know? If neither of you know, find out and then get back together and discuss it. This came up in Cambridge University, at the ISOC. Jay Smith was there. And he effectively won the day because the people against him didn't know the background. The background to this is that it is about a year after the conquest of Mecca, where the Muslim state now is being secured from within, and Mecca now, is all the idols have been purged. The Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, had just come back from book to book, where he had established the safety of the northern border, and now he's come back, and Allah reveals to him, after the sacred months are over, abolish the treaties. Why? Because you want to get rid of these groups which have caused sedition within the Muslim state. Before they get together, before they get strong enough to be a force against you. You are now strong enough to force them out. It was a one-off situation. It doesn't apply for all time. It applies to purifying the Muslim state. And that's why it says, ask you for asylum, grant it to you. Talk to him about Islam. If he accepts, let him stay. If he doesn't accept, escort him to a place of safety. So in other words, it's humane treatment. Compare that, that with modern day warfare. Carpet bombing. No prisons. Indiscriminate killing. In fact, the Americans and the Iraq war. There's nothing like it. And you should really read the first ayah of ch chapter 9 through to chapter to, to verse 6. That gives the background. Okay? And once you know the background, you know that it does not apply for all time. But if you just read that and someone quotes that to you, this is the verse of the sword. Muslims can do what they like whenever they like. Just go and kill anyone, anywhere. It's not true. But what do we know? And the answer is next to nothing, unfortunately. And I'm getting close to the time. Hopefully I'm over time. I'm just about finished. You'll be pleased to know. That's when um, the, um, a number of things were told to leave Packer. They were given a year. And then people, this is where it gets pathetic. People say, because man was created from dust, he can't be created from blood. Because he was created from water, he can't be created from something else, from clay. It's ridiculous. If I say I'm a creature of flesh and blood, does that preclude my being human? Does that preclude my having water in my body? Or bones? Nothing that's exclusive.
But then this is where we get silly. But we need to look beyond stereotypes. Islam is democratic in spirit, consensus, right to vote, right to education, right to the profession, govern themselves by consensus and discussion. No priestly hierarchy. In Islam, each person is responsible for him or herself. Everyone is equal before God, only differ in their piety. And again, I said, you have to look and see what you mean by equal. We're not equal in height. Okay? We're not equal in size. Okay? So on and so forth. Not equal in wealth. Okay? Allah looks at our piety. And how does he award us? If we pray, we get the same reward as someone else who prays, depending on our concentration, assuming we could do that. Okay? So on and so forth. No racism in Islam. But I actually dispute that slightly. Because some people say that you have to marry from the same village. Okay? So, and that's not racism. I mentioned that. Guarantees, right to keep family names, any names they work for their own, right to agree with who they were married, right to initiate divorce, number of female students in units in Muslim countries are going up. Not so long ago, I was asked by the ISOC here if I would talk to some students who were taking Islamic economics. And the statement that had been given was that when the wealth of a country reaches a certain amount, that education is available to many more people. And as people get more education, they want a greater say in their affairs, and so you get democracy in the country. Why haven't the rich oil states become democracies? Answer, the Islam is holding them back. Okay? So I was asked if I would talk to them from the Islamic perspective. So what I said to them was, you have to find out from your professors if they will accept the fact that you don't come to that conclusion. I cannot give you information which will bring you to that conclusion. I can give you information which will take you away from that conclusion, but if that's what they want, you won't get the marks. They came back and they said, so long as we can justify our conclusions, it doesn't matter what conclusions we come to. Okay, so then I gave them information. And just as I had finished, and they gave me the draft um, drafts of the reports, the Rand Institute in the States came out with a study on just the same thing, and what they concluded was that it was not a question of Islam that might have an effect, but it would be minimal. It was a question of foreign investment. That's what governs the ability of a country to become democratic. And China has demonstrated that. It's a question of, in globalization, you have to make the laws. You have to make the laws to protect foreign investment. Okay? And because you're making laws for the foreign investment, it has to be a democracy has to be tied up with globalization. So that when the com company comes in, they can invest in the country, they won't get their money taken away. And if you look at that, you've got Union Carbide in Bhopal in India, which still haven't paid compensation to the people that were destroyed there. Okay? This is a democracy. Now, once you've got that, you have to have laws made which will protect that investment. And once those laws are made, this is a democracy. Then the company comes in, they exploit the wealth, they get the benefits, a few people in the country get the benefits, and the poor people get nothing. Indonesia. Classic, classic case in okay. And so on. And Africa. How is it that we find out after the event that there were diamonds in um, whichever state it was, Congo, in um, one of these states where, what was it, the son of... Thatcher, was it Mark Thatcher, was involved with some guy who was trying to start a rebellion there or something, and it turns out that there's diamonds there, all these sort of things. It's very strange. How is it we find these things out after the event? Okay. We've got purity of food today, we tolerate of other faiths, we encourage the pursuit of religious freedom, we want individual liberty and an ethic based on right action. Now, this is H.G. Wells, the genuine Islam. I've always had the religion of Muhammad in high estimation because of his wonderful vitality. It is the only religion which appears to me to possess that assimilating capacity for the changing phase of existence which can make itself appeal to every age. I have prophesied about the faith of Muhammad that it would be acceptable to Europe of tomorrow, that it is beginning to be acceptable to the Europe of today. That's H.G. Wells in 1936. This is Prince Charles. And remember, I said we go back to the 6th century where people had ignored Islam. Because we have tended to see Islam as the enemy of the West, as an alien culture, society, and system of belief, we've tended to ignore or erase its great relevance to our own history. Remember this Middle Ages I mentioned, the missing gap? Okay. 
And then, this is Obama, a student of history, also known civilization, debt to Islam. It was Islam at places like al so that carried the light and turning through so many centuries, paving the way for Europe's Renaissance and Enlightenment. See, he's given credit to it. Renaissance and Enlightenment was based on what? It was based on Islam, the Islamic concepts of philosophy and knowledge seeking. It was innovation in Muslim communities, the developed the order of algebra, and magnetic compass and tools of navigation, a mastery of pens and printing, our understanding of how disease spreads and how it can be healed. The Islamic torture has given us majestic arches and soaring spires, timeless poetry and cherished music, elegant calligraphy and peaceful contemplation. Remember I mentioned English garden purposely. And throughout history, Islam has demonstrated through words and deeds the possibilities of religious tolerance and racial equality. This was his speech in Egypt. We need to know religion. We need to rebuild our relationship with the Quran, understand and practice it. It's the Quran which will bring us back to Allah. We need to make sure our children know Islam. Teaching it is not enough. They must understand it. it's the need of the hour. This is what should be the responsibility of the madrasas today. Each one of us has to get involved. Two or three references. I said you can get copies of this, uh, the whole presentation if you want to. Nothing, nothing clever about it. I'm a little over time. I apologise for that, but we're a little late like, starting. I told you. Yeah. Jazakallah khair. Well, that was Matthews. Uh, we'll have a question and answer session now, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to put your hand up.